Thank you so much for joining me uh, this morning or afternoon, depends on the time. Uh, we have uh, two hours uh, reading time, and then we possibly have an hour of uh, you know people's reaction to this. It is the continuation of uh, reading the uh, Fatherless People by Dr. Deliogun. And so far, this history tells us more about uh, the characters and the roles they played in shaping and forming this current uh, Nigeria. And for those of us who are now kind of getting uh, a little bit interested in reading these histories now, so we've advised everyone that in uh, reading your history, you will find out that um, our ancestors, they were not uh, all good and they were not all bad. But the, their own actions or inaction at the time led us to where we are today. Do not be a prisoner of uh, history. Be a student of history. Somebody will learn from their, uh, you know, from their good uh, decisions and at the same time learn from their bad decisions too. Never to find yourself in that, uh, you know, that situation. Or maybe if you do find yourself in that situation, you will never make the same mistake again. So, Anthony Enahoro was the one who first moved the motion for the Nigeria independence, that Nigeria should be given independence in 1956. So, at this point, they said it was now the time for all political parties to react. So, we shall continue reading from page 206, and that is uh, chapter 7 page 206. After Enahoro's letter or motion, the reactions that followed. So we shall start now. Uh, before that, by the way, if you do have something that you are doing, like maybe you are at work or you are driving or you are busy somehow, you do not have to sit there and watch this. You can listen to it like a podcast. I've had people who said, in fact, mm -hmm, it actually has helped them while they are busy with some tasks like uh, knitting. Anyway, whatever works for you, but share the broadcast, share the video as you are joining. So we shall continue now. So they say with an hour's motion, the action group had lobbed a political grenade into the new House of Representatives, and all political parties had to take a position. Up until this point, the relationship be between the Awolowo led action group and the Amadou Bello led Northern People's Congress in the House of Representatives had been constructive. They were united by opposition to Azikiwe's drive for a unitary Nigeria. This dramatic move for independence on Nigerian terms brought about a dramatic realignment of the political forces within the House of Representatives. While the issue while the issue reunited East and West, it served to drive a firm wedge between the North and the South. <clears throat> the MPC, which had never had any appetite for mixing its political fortunes with the Southerners in the first place, and which had only agreed to do so under British pressure and in the expectation that a British, a British rule would continue for some time to come, 
while it prepared itself for the new political game, was now being invited to commit political suicide. The move was to drive the NPC leadership closer to the British in one of their records, they wrote. The relationship between ministers and British civil servants on executive council was such that we would, in many ways, have described ourselves as a genuinely biracial government. There were, of course, occasional misunderstandings and clashes of temperament, temperament, but a consciousness of common purpose assisted throughout. The British were not the enemy. The enemy lay beyond the Niger in the presence of the political leaders and their followers who desired independence for Nigeria before the North was ready. In order, the North was convinced to dominate the whole. Britain under Churchill had no intention of giving in to the nationalists' demands for independence in 1956. It was not just that, I mean, it was not just that they were not going to be dictated to by the word of mouth only demands of the nationalists. There were other considerations. The intentions of losing its largest colony in Africa so soon after. Also, 1956 was the year in which Sudan was due to be decoupled from Egypt. And December 1956 was the deadline that the Americans had given for British withdrawal of all their troops from the Suez Canal in Egypt. At a more strategic level, the North and the Army, both of which the military, I mean the British were counting upon to keep power out of the hands of the nationalists, had not been fully readied for their role. The defense strategy was a simple one of playing for time, although achieving it required sophisticated parliamentary maneuvers for which the nationalists were no match. The first move was to use parliamentary procedures with the help of the NPC leadership to prevent the nationalists' independence motion being debated. So, on the day of the of debate in March 1953, the Council of Ministers, unable to avoid the motion, had placed it last of the eight on the other paper, confident that it could not be reached by the end of the day's sitting and would therefore lapse. We had an answer. Notice of five or six of the motions stood in the names of NCNC members, one after another, they begged to withdraw and not to move. The next move of the Biracia team in the North was for Amadou Bello to move a motion to amend the Enahoro motion by substituting as soon as practicable for 1956. Although, this amending motion was seconded neither the original nor the amending motion made it through to debate because another member of the NPC team had been lined up to move a motion adjoining the whole debate. The move took the action group and the nationalists by surprise. Confronted by the starkness of the North decision to delay independence from colonial rule, Pandemonium followed as tempers flared and abuses were exchanged on the floor of the house. The country was thrown into its first national political crisis as the action group, as the action group members and NCNC members staged a walkout and the action group ministers tendered their resignations. 
the following day, the Sardauna is said to have closed the adjournment debate for the House with the word in quotes, the mistake of 1914, when the protectorate of Northern and Southern Nigeria were united, <clears throat> has now come to light. Lagos was the venue for this House of Representatives meeting, and the Lagos political crowds rain abuses upon the Northern delegates. When the Southern press and political parties joined together to deride the NPC members as imperialist stooges, the Northern leaders began to reconsider the options for separate existence from the South. When ethnic clashes broke out in Kano in May 1953, after the action group decided to take its campaign for self-government in 1956 direct to the people of the North, a new urgency was injected into the matter. As 36 people were killed, with many more injured. That the victims were mainly Igbos is ironic, given that this was essentially a standoff between the West and the North. The North was now threatening to secede with crowds of Araba, meaning separation. The secession of the North, sorry, the secession of the North threatened catastrophe for British plans for influence post independence, as they would have felt compelled to take actions to stop the secession attempts by the very group they were depending upon for post independence influence. Behind the scene, the colonial office wasted no time in launching a charm offensive in the North to dissuade them, underlining the fact that the imperative of keeping the North in political union with the South was a British one. On 7th April, 1953, Sherwood Smith wrote to the colonial office. He wrote, Substantially, what has occurred in, I mean, is that the Northern members of the Central Legislature, resentful of and disgusted at the maneuvers, manners, and methods of the Southern political leaders and their followers, have found themselves mentally back where their representatives were at the opening of the Ibadan Conference with their worst fears realized, they are now, in effect, demanding a complete reassessment of the position with a view in their present frame of mind to asking for separation with some form of association at the center to protect their interests. This can be taken as the worst possible alternative of all, and we hope to improve on it appreciably as time passes of quote that was a shawu smith letter to the colonial colonial office on the matter uh give me a sec right azikiwe had been reduced to watching the constitutional crisis surrounding Naoro's independence motion from the visitors gallery of the Federal House of Representatives, having maneuvered himself out of central politics. Fortunately for him, his need for the help of the British to get back in was more than matched by their need for him to be there as a counterweight to Awolowo in order to avoid the danger of the South being reunited under the personality of a single leader. The British duly made the constitutional changes and the way was clear for Azikiwe to return from political wilderness in the Western House of Assembly to contest new elections in the East as a pathway to the House of Representatives. After the Eastern Region, the Region House of Assembly 
was dissolved. New regional election was held in May 1953, in which Azikiwe was successfully allow, I mean, sorry, was successful, allowing him to formally assume the leadership of the region, regional governments in the East. But by removing the Eyo Ita government in this way, Azikiwe had damaged what unity there had been between the Igbos and the minority groups of the Eastern region. This was to have consequences for Eastern region unity later on. The appeasement of the North. On the 21st May, 1953, a telegram arrived in the, in the colonial office. It contained warning of a hardening of the North determination to put as much distance as possible between itself and the South. So in that telegram, in the aftermath of the 31st March self-government debate in the House of Representatives, separatist sentiment grew stronger among Northern political leaders. The day after order had been restored following the Kano riot, the Northern Region House of Assembly debated the motion, the so-called <clears throat> eight-point motion, outlined in this document. The motion was carried without any dissenting votes and was passed by the Northern Region House of Chiefs on the same day. In effect, the motion called for regional autonomy in all but the most limited spheres there would in effect be no central government for Nigeria and only a restricted central agency. Sensing that the situation was spiraling out of control, on the same day, the colonial government announced that it was convening a conference in London to revise the Macpherson constitution. This was the conference above all others which cast the mold for the political order of the soon to be independent country. Its, import, I mean, its importance was reflected in the fact that it was conducted under the circumstance, I mean, sorry, under the chairmanship of the colonial secretary, Oliver Litutin. A sense of the way in which the exercise was managed and be gleaned from the following comments by. Anthony Hedde, I mean Heading. On our party's return to office in 1951, the post of colonial secretary had special significance. Whoever held that office would have to guide and influence hopes and ambitions in every continent. Mr. Oliver Lituten, now Lord Chandos, did this work brilliantly and selflessly. He charted the course for the conservative administration in colonial affairs. His successor may be said to have chosen himself. Mr. Lennox Boyd had, he has given his whole life to the study of colonial problems and colonial territories and today commands unrivaled knowledge and experience. He has held the colonial office with distinction and acclaim in a period of endless harassment. Colony after colony, inspired or infected by the universal bacillus of uh, nationalism, has tried to run before it could walk with patient care and parental indulgence the colonial secretary has led their first footsteps. His guiding hand has always been there, unobtrusively. If all his charges have not grown up with the code of conduct in which he had instructed them, that, I mean, that is not the fault of their patient guiding. 
Mr. Lennox Boy's success is due to his real affection for the colonies and to an infinite capacity for taking pains. It has also been due to a cheerful willingness to discard where need be the conventions of white all. The British desire for a united Nigeria was completely at odds with what the Northern political leadership were insisting upon at this time, which was a loose federation with effectively no central government as security against Southern domination. The way the colonial office sought to reconcile the British agenda with the North concern was to produce a Nigeria united under the control of the North. In the wake of the crisis following the Enauru's motion for independence, they recognized that a temporary retreat from the goal of a unitary Nigeria was necessary. This appears from the colonial office reply on 18th April 1953 to Sherwood Smith's letter of 7th April 1953. The colonial office wrote, we firmly believe that unity is in the best interest of all regions of Nigeria. But we recognize that the only solution for present difficulties and probably the only hope eventually of achieving and preserving that unity lies in some modified and user form of association at the center. The 1953 conference marked the beginning of the journey towards the end game. The key objectives of the British for the conference were to make changes to the structure of the Federation that would reassure the North that there was no likelihood of it ever coming under the rule of the South, whilst at the same time, managing the demands of the nationalists in the South for self-rule. The key elements of the strategy were, one, a new constitution with a looser federation. Two, the uh, accession of Lagos from the Western region. Three, the division of the British Cameroonians to achieve a population shift in favor of the North. Four, a compromise position between North and South on self-governance. And five, federal election in 1954. So starting with the new constitution. The constitution that emerged from the conference known as the Littleton Constitution after the conference chairman federated the Northern region now further enlarged by the integration of what was British Northern Cameroon with now four units in the South, the Western region, the Eastern region, the Southern Cameroons, and the Federal Territory of Lagos. It provided for a, a House of Representatives made up of 184 members, with 92 seats for the Northern region and 92 seats, sorry, 92 seats for the Northern region and 92 seats shared between the four units in the South with 42 seats each for the Western and Eastern regions, six seats for the Southern Cameroons and two seats or Lagos. The other major feature to protect the North was the establishment of a civil service for each region in place of the unitary civil service. It was the dismantling of these constitutional safeguards in 1966 in an attempt to create United Nigeria by the first military government that was to take the country back to the crisis of 1953, the accession of Lagos from the Western region. Nigeria was a British creation. And so long as the country remained under British rule, 
it was an easy thing for the state to treat all subjects of the colony as one people and for the people to relate to each other as such. With the open borders under the protection of the colonial government, a level of migration was achieved by the more mobile ethnic group than would otherwise have been possible. The chief beneficiaries of this state of political and economic union were the entrepreneurial and industrious Igbos, whose possibilities were only constrained by their limited and, uh, and their territory, so to say. Lagos, having been a British colony since 1861, and having served as the seat of the colonial government since 1914, had become a magnet for seekers of opportunity and fortune from all over the country. Being historically part of Yoruba land, non-Yorubas were to be found residing there in much greater quantities than Yorubas would be found living outside of Yoruba land. The Ebe Omo Dudua, with his mission statement of working to unite the various clans and tribes in Yoruba land, had generally to create and actively foster the idea of a single nationalism throughout Yoruba land. Had an obvious interest in having the colony of Lagos treated as part of the Western region. Azikiwe, the Igbo champion, with an eye on the interest of the large Igbo community in Lagos and the many more overseas who might be expected to settle in Lagos on their return, argued for Lagos to be kept separate from the Western region. Given his personal experience in the aftermath of the 1951 regional elections, Azikiwe had a special interest in ensuring that the link between Lagos and the central legislature was freestanding and not dependent upon the Western House of Assembly acting as a form of electoral college. It was not, however, a purely Yoruba Igbo divide as many Yorubas in Lagos, like H.O. Davis, uh, viewed themselves as a separate breed from their fellow nation I mean, nationals on the mainland. With the NPC and NCNC taking a common stand with the British on the issue, the decision of the conference was that from 1954, Lagos should be excised, I mean, excised uh, from the Western region and stand independently as the federal capital territory. From the British perspective, the move represented an, an important bargaining chip for use in more crucial constitutional discussions, which were to follow. The division of the British Cameroonians. Of the many unfortunate experiences of colonialism in Africa, that of the people of the land that the Germans called Cameroon has been amongst the most unfortunate having almost literally being hung, drawn, and quartered at different points in time between Germans, the French, and the British. It will be recalled from chapter three that the original British plan was for Cameroon to be part of Nigeria until this plan was frustrated when, German, and when Germany stole a march on them and claimed the territory. Then, in the aftermath of Germany's defeat in the First World War, Cameroon was divided on a West-East basis by the League of Nations and given to British and France, respectively, to govern as League of Nations mandates. Through this process, a generation of Cameroonians found themselves speaking the three main languages of Western Europe. English, French, and German, and in the process being exposed to their contrasting cultures. 
Now, the people of British Cameroon were to find themselves being used as pawns in the Nigerian political gerrymandering exercise. The strategic objective of the colonial government was 